Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome again as we bring to you another episode of Ask Huda. I'm your host, Fuad Muhammad. We also have the pleasure of introducing on the show today our very own Dr. Muhammad Salah. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakum Allah khairan, Fuad, wa barakallahu fikum. Just before we go into our questions, we'd like to remind you of our telephone mm-hmm. numbers 00 248 or 249. Or you can send your questions via email at ask, that's ask at huda.tv. Our first question on the show today is from Brother Ibrahim from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And he wants to know what was the tahiyat of the Prophet وسلم, during his time. Bismillah rahman rahim الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأولين والآخرين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين praise be to Allah alone we praise him and we seek his help whomsoever Allah guides is a truly guided one and whomsoever Allah leaves astray no one can show him guidance may the best peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم there is a sound hadith narrated by Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. May Allah be pleased with him, who said that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught me how to recite at tahiyyat the Drood Sharif, the last part of the prayer, which is at tashahud before making taslim, as he used to teach me one of the chapters of the Quran. He gave him an extra care in teaching him at tashahud and it is called at tashahud because the most important phase in this supplication is when you say Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abiduhu wa rasul so he said he took hold of my kaf or hand or palm between his two palms and he taught me to say at tahiyyatu lillah wa salawat wa tayyibat assalamu alayka ayyuha an nabiyyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh السلام علينا وعلى عباد الله الصالحين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله Up to that this is the first part which we recite in the middle تشهد mm-hmm. and there is the narration of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud may Allah be pleased with him which is collected by Imam al-Bukhari In other forms the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa taught us the rest of التشهد because this part of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud's narration will be mm. recited in the middle tashahud in a prayer which consists of three uh, or four rakahs, more than two. So it has a middle tashahud, this is what we recite. In the last tashahud, we recite the previous part in addition to the following. We say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala ali Ibrahim. O oh Allah, bless Muhammad and the family of Muhammad, peace be upon him and them, as you did bless and uh, cover with mercy Prophet Ibrahim and the family of Prophet Ibrahim. Wabarak, al-baraka is also a blessing. Mm-hmm. Al-salah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the mercy and uh, baraka is the blessing. And bless the family, bless Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the family of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as you did bless the family of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi wa sallam innaka hamidun majid verily you are indeed all worthy of praise and glorification Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad kama sallayta ala ali Ibrahim wa barik ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad كما باركت على آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد. Then afterward, if it is the last tashahud, it is recommended to supplicate with whatever supplication that you perfect. Normally, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to invoke Allah سبحانه وتعالى and seek refuge with Him. Again, is four things. He used to say, اللهم إني أعوذ بك من فتنة المحيا والممات. وفتنة المسيخ الدجال اللهم إني أعوذ بك من عذاب في النار وعذاب في القبر O oh Allah I seek refuge with you again is the trial of life and death the trial of the grave the trial of the false messiah and uh, أعوذ بك من عذاب في النار وعذاب في القبر and I seek refuge with you from the torment of the grave and the torment of the fire of hell Amen 
Okay, Jazakallah Khair Shaykh. We have Sister Mariam from the UAE. Assalamu alaikum, Sister. You're live on Ask Her There. Questions, please. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, yes, I'd like to ask uh, Brother Salah, uh, Muhammad Salah a question, please. Okay. Um, uh, it's regarding uh, alternative therapy uh, that's starting to be used a lot in Dubai, uh, where I live. It's called Crystal Healing and Reiki. Um, since joining some of the Islamic halakas here, uh, I've come across a lot of sisters who don't actually speak English who have asked me to ask this question of you. Um, they're actually into the doing this Reiki, and some of the Reiki people who they go to are actually using the Qur'an also, parts of the verses of the Qur'an. Um, they're only Arabic speakers, so they've asked me to ask you your opinion on this. Okay. And uh, for me, myself, I understand it's uh, not allowed. I feel it is a uh, shirk. Mm -hmm. What is the main but theme of that treatment or healing? It's a crystal healing. They actually put crystals. She explained they put crystals. Uh, different colors on certain parts of the body mm -hmm. and sometimes they also uh, raise their hand above the part of the body and uh, they they um, are able to find the pain and relieve the pain of the person if they're suffering from mm -hmm. uh, the sister who's asked me she's um, are they licensed uh, uh, sorry brother are they licensed uh, they're licensed by the government yes this is licensed to the ministry of uh, health mm which is a government organization, mm -hmm. but I tried to explain to her that it didn't sound uh, like it would be halal in Islam to do these things because of the idea of healing, who is doing the healing, who is providing the healing. Mm -hmm. We should ha have our faith with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And who's uh, providing the healing? Well, for me, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of course, but these people believe... Now, I'm talking about, uh, uh, are there specific people with the specific faith, for instance, who are practicing this or... Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, brother. Some of the people who are practicing this are Muslims themselves. Okay. And they're doing this healing and also uh, using parts of the Quran for that. So the sister has asked me for your advice because she's not an English-speaking Muslim. Okay. Sister, I will not be able to answer you today as I have to go back and make my own research in order to find out the reality of this alternative therapy or healing. And uh, I do not say it sounds haram or it should be haram because... Um, sometimes we, out of being cautious, we say, I think it's, it's haram, it should be haram. And that indeed itself is a major sin. Allah the Almighty says, Ya ayuhan lima tuharrimu ma ahallallahu lak. Once the Prophet sallallahu was asked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to correct himself in, in, in an issue, he said, why do you consider as unlawful what Allah made it lawful? And in another verse he said, قُلْ مَنْ حَرَّمَ زِينَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي أَخْرَجَ لِعِبَادِهِ وَالطَّيِّبَاتِ مِنَ الرِّزْقِ So everybody perfects to say no, and it is haram, or disliked, or prohibited, or should be banned. But in order to pass a ruling, الْحُكْمُ عَلَى الشَّيْءِ فَرْعٌ مِنْ تَصَوُّرِهِ You have to understand its nature. Yes. You cannot say whether yes or no, or lawful or unlawful, unless if you know the theme of the uh, thing, the, the, the nature of this remedy, what do they use? The, the term alternative medicine is a very large and has a very broad meaning. Alternative medicine could be by homeopathy, by um, medicinal plants, and all of that is perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. Or by the ruqya, that too is recommended and approved. Mm -hmm. But we would try to find out about uh, using the crystals in the healing process. Thank you, sister, for asking this question anyway. Okay, that was Sister Mariam. We have Sister Aqida from Egypt. Salaamu alaykum, sister. You're live and ask all your questions, please. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi. Um, first of all, I'd like to say um, I'm very glad that they've kept up Huda um, for the new year. It's one of my favorite shows on Huda TV. And Thank the you. question is... Um, Basically, I travelled to Egypt to get away from, I'm from London originally, mm. um, I came here to study, to learn Quran and to learn more about my religion, um, but my granddad passed away, so I'm having to travel back to London for the funeral, but without my mahram. I just wanted to know, is this an actual sin, or is it just not recommended to travel without your... Um, do, you have, uh, do you have any male mahram with you in Egypt? No, just uh, basically my mahram is my brother, just his friend, um, but no, no male mahram, I'm here by myself. So who dropped you off to Egypt? Pardon? Who dropped you off to Egypt from London? 
Who is Courtney? I came here by myself as well. Oh, okay, okay. And you're living here by yourself as well? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I would say, sister, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited women from traveling the travel distance alone without a male mahram. But in cases of emergency, if there is no uh, way to have a male mahram, then at least a safe company. So if you think that's a necessity and you have to go and you don't have anybody to escort you in this condition, it will be permissible to travel uh, without uh, a mahram, providing that you should have uh, some family member expect you at the airport and escort you and so on. So you will be the person to determine whether it's a necessity or not. And Allah knows best. Okay, Jazakallah Khair, Sister Aqeda from Egypt. We have also Sister Um Yahya from Egypt. Assalamu alaikum, Sister, you're live on Ask Kuda. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Would you please give me father two minutes to say two words and then ask my question? You got the two minutes. Jazakum Allah. Wa jazakum. We know that the one who doesn't thank others doesn't thank Allah. Therefore, my first word is a big shock to every individual. Working or supporting Huda. I pray Allah Azza wa Jal to make things easy for you. And Amen. soon we will have Huda in different languages. And Amen. other channels will be following its footsteps. Amen. Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَلَا تُزَكُّ أَنفُسَكُمْ بَلِ اللَّهُ يُزَكِّ مَنْ يَشَاءُ So I do ask Allah al Kareem to give you such tazkiyah min عِنْدِهِ And for my second word, it's related to Adin al nasiha and it concerns women. So I remind myself, mothers, sisters and daughters, who seek madat Allah and try to obey Allah by lowering the gaze to put a scarf on the screen while listening to shiur or men generally speaking. Most important, to hide men's faces. I find out since buying TV last Ramadan that this is one of the best tools to achieve such goals and mm-hmm. enjoy at the same time the benefits of watching TV. Otherwise, if not paying attention, once the Adrada could be negatively affected. As for my question, brothers, okay. I wonder why only few righteous of the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who revived the Uf of our Prophet and Sahaba Ridwanullahi ta'ala alayhim, the Uf of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Sahaba. I mean the Uf which doesn't contradict Sharia and which benefits are highly valuable. An example to clarify is a hope that one day the Waliyu al-Amr al-Taqi will not find any shame or humiliation when asking a righteous person to be a zawj salih for his daughter, sister, mother, or even Amma or khala. Mm-hmm. And remember the marriage of Musa alayhi salam no. and what Umar did with Ummina Hafsa radiallahu anhuma wa awdahuma. Forgive me for time taken. Barakallahu feekum. Alhamdulillah. Wassalamu alaikum. Rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Barakallahu feekum. Thank you, sister. That's Umm Yahya there. The director is doing totally the opposite of what you just requested. But mm. I would like to comment on uh, your words. Thank you so much for the nasiha. Indeed, ad-dinu and nasiha. Uh, our religion is all about sincerity and paying a sincere advice. You have something to say first? Okay, inshallah. Let's take a okay. sister we'll Zoya from, uh, Canada. from Canada. Then, inshallah. Salaam alaykum, alaykum, sister. You're live and ask her their question. Wa alaykum, wa alaykum salam. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am 10 years old and I have three questions. Okay. I would like, I would really appreciate if you can answer in this episode as I will be in school on Tuesday. Okay. If it is not answered today. <coughs> okay. Go ahead with your question. My first question is, I want to learn in God, so I have heard you cannot cover your face in Salah. Can you please give me advice? Okay. And in my second question, during Hajj in Ikram, should you cover your whole, your face during Salah? Okay. And my third question is, can you ask Dua after first Salah, as I heard the Prophet did not? Okay. Okay, Jazakallah Khair, Sister Zewiya there from Canada. We have Brother Mukhtar as well from the UAE. Assalamu alaikum, Brother, you're live on Ask Kudir. Questions, please. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. I wanted to ask uh, the Sheikh uh, mm-hmm. if a person cannot read Arabic text mm-hmm. of the Quran, if he wanted to, like, you know, hear the, 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 the I mean, he wants to hear the Quran and mm-hmm. he wants to write it in English to, to memorize it. Okay. Is it uh, permissible to do it? Okay. okay. I mean to uh, to memorize it. And my second question is regarding the dua al-qunut. 
Okay. It is, it is like you said that we should read it uh, in the water prayer. Okay. Where exactly we should read it? In the last prakat or okay. in, the, in between? Yes. Okay. Okay, Jazakallah Khair, Brother Mukhtar there from the UAE. Uh, if you would like to continue. Now, um, I'd like to comment on uh, Umu Yahya's remarks, which are very beautiful. The first one, I don't know if this is a coincidence, you're talking about giving thanks to those who are supporting Huda TV. It, it might be amazing that it is not necessarily the rich people, rather it is the poor. Very few of the rich people who are doing that. But uh, it, it is shocking to know that people would donate as little as 10 bucks, 20 bucks, and 30 bucks. And I believe that it is Allah's blessings which makes this very little bit of donations abundant and great. We just had a, a meeting before the program where the number of the team have been reduced to more than half. And uh, I... Uh, I had to confront everybody and I tell them that unfortunately you cannot do any better. So if you uh, think it is too hard for you to observe such struggle and jihad, because I know that everybody has to put bread on the table for their kids. And unfortunately in most cases we're not able to pay the salaries on time and sometimes people are delayed for, for months. And they may get a part or a portion of their salaries until next month and so on. So I said if you find another lawful job Please seek it because we do not promise to have any better conditions because only Allah the Almighty knows when it will get better. Unfortunately, many of the wealthy Muslims are investing their money in haram media, in movie making, in songs, in video clips. And they're competing in that billions and billions of Muslims money invested in, in, in these fields. And uh, I feel sad to say that this is the only channel, maybe there is another one channel worldwide, which is airing a pure Islamic media as we assume and Allah knows best, and giving da'wah, and alhamdulillah it is very influencing, and people have accepted Islam, and many Muslims who are not aware of their deen have come to realize the true religion through this channel and this pulpit. But once again, I want to confirm that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who opened this channel and I'm sure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will maintain it because there is a secret in it. There is so much barakah with the little bit of donations that people donate. A lady would call and say, I'd like to sponsor one episode of Ask Huda and it would do a lot of barakah. Many people say, I see you guys producing programs and having nice sets and decor mm. and so on. You will not believe how this is happening. This is all done internally. We do everything by hand. This is a little secret that I'm revealing it for the first time. And it appears so good on the screen that you will not believe how much it costs. It is the barakah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts in this kind of work. So may Allah maintain it. And I see this opportunity to encourage those who have the means, those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed with the means to invest it in the proper place in giving da'wah, this is the highest form of jihad, of struggling for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Second, with regards to veiling the screen with the scarf or whatever, I may agree with you if the viewer, if the woman or the sister who's watching senses some shahwa or a desire. In this condition, she has to lower her gaze. Or just listen to the audio as I advised some before. But in general, looking at the man, whether he's a sheikh or a teacher, is not prohibited. The man's face is not a aura. The man's hair and eyes and hands are not a aura. But it would become prohibited to look for a man, to look at a man if she enjoys looking at him. Mm. In this condition we say, then you should avoid the doubtful matters and stay away from what's prohibited. Uh, what was the third point? It was a very interesting one as well. Thank you so much, sister. You're very outspoken, mashallah, and you're very articulated. And in brief, you made your points. May Allah bless you. Amen. Concerning reviving a tradition, this Amen. tradition is, is a very wonderful one, which is in our culture, especially the Arabic and the indo pak cultures, that it's a shame that the guy would go to somebody and say, would you marry my daughter or my sister or my mother who's been widowed or, 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 or. There is nothing wrong with that. And the sister draws some examples. Mm. But it is not always like that. It has to be judged with certain rules and guidelines. Mm. When a girl called me and she said that 
she thinks that this person is the most befitting person for her. She would like, she would love to have him as her life mate. Can she tell him that? I said no. If you have a brother or a god or a father or an uncle, any of them, you can you can share with them this feeling. It is okay. We cannot deny love. Yes. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in one hadith, "I haven't seen any solution for love better than marriage." If there are couple who are in love for a reason or another, they have met, they have heard each other, or, 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 then marriage is a solution if it is accessible. But if the, the girl, if the woman cannot convey this message because of her modesty, الْحَيَاءُ مِنَ iman, One of the branches of faith is to have modesty and shyness and bashfulness. So I said, no, do not reveal that to him. Rather have one of your family members uh, who may befriend the person and share with him that would like to have you as a husband for our daughter or sister or whatever. Because we're not in the era of the companions, nor at tabi'een. Whenever the first problem would arise, he would say, I was never interested in you. Mm-hmm. You are the one who ran after me. You are the one who asked for my hand, etc., etc. So that's why it would be best if you talk to a local imam or a sheikh or a common friend or the best one of the family members in order to do this task on your behalf. Thank you, sister, once again. May Allah bless you. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. We have sister Um Abdul Rahman from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum, sister. You're live on Ask Your Questions, please. Alaikum assalam. I had two questions. Okay. The first, the first question is, um, I want to know um, your comment, your opinion about. Um, I have dreams. They are good and bad dreams. Um, some of them, they're not either good or, or bad. They're just neutral dreams. However, often my dreams come true. Mm-hmm. I never describe my bad dreams to anybody. But I have noticed that several of my dreams have come true. I just wanted to know your opinion about that. Okay. The other thing is, um, how, how does Allah respond to duas? of the oppressed more so than the regular duas. I wanted to know that question. Okay. Did you get this question? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Jazakallah khair, Sister Umm Abdul Rahman. There we have Brother Muhammad as well from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Assalamu alaikum, Brother. You live and ask for their questions, please. Brother Muhammad? Yeah, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to ask you a clarification. That it is said that after Fajr, if you are praying until, uh, are making the uh, Quran and Tilawab and mm. until uh, sunrise, there is a great reward. Mm. So is it necessary, like if you are performing the prayer in masjid, to sit in the masjid until sunrise or you can come home and uh, continue until sunrise and the same reward you will have. Okay. This clarification please. Okay. Jazakallah okay. khair, Muhammad there. From Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We have uh, Sister Shafia asking. She said that I was told, and this is the question of Zuya from uh, Canada as well, uh, that the Prophet ﷺ never made dua after salah. And she wants to know what's the right uh, opinion according to the Sunnah. Number one, it is recommended to make supplication and dua after achieving any good and righteous deeds, any ibadah. And that's why we, we make invocation about, um, upon breaking our fast. It is highly recommended. One of the times uh, during which dua is most likely to be accepted. In Hajj, فَإِذَا قَضَيْتُمْ مَنَاسِكَكُمْ فَذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ كَذِكِكُمْ آبَاءَكُمْ أَوْ أَشَدَّ ذِكْرًا Then Allah recommended to make dua and invoke him seeking from the pleasures of this life and the hereafter upon performing and completing the manasik of the Hajj and uh, the Umrah. So, every time somebody makes a good deed, it is recommended to make dua. But the confusion comes when some people consider making dua, raising the hands, especially congregationally, after every fard, an inseparable part from the salah. We were raised according to that, that after we finish the salah, the imam would make the khitam out loud, then he will make dua and will join him. Then, it has become like a tradition. Mm-hmm. And that we say, no, that's not prescribed. And doing it routinely on a regular basis, it makes it seem as 
a, a, a compulsory part or highly recommended or a tradition. Mm-hmm. While Ummul Mu'mineen Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, narrated a very interesting hadith collected by Imam Bukhari. She said that, إِنْ كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ لَيَدَعُ الْعَمَلَ وَهُوَ يُحِبُّهُ خَشْيَةَ أَنْ يُفْرَضَ عَلَىٰ أَصْحَابِهِ That sometimes the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would quit doing some good righteous deeds even though or despite the fact that he loves to do it. Fearing that his companions might think it is, since it's done on a regular basis, it's a must. Mm-hmm. Or it's a tradition that you have to do it. So we say if somebody after making khitam salah made invocation mm-hmm. every once in a while, not on a regular basis, that is permissible. And this is a recommended time to make dua as well. But it is not a part of the khitam of the salah or a part of the prayer. The dua after the prayer is recommended after reciting at tashahud or at tahiyyat and before making taslim. This is one of the best times to make dua. Okay. And we have Sister Sadiqa asking that she says that women normally have some discharges between their menstrual cycles and she wants to know what is required for these women in order to purify themselves. Do they have to wash the place and repeat wudu at every discharge? This is called a regular bleeding. The regular one is the monthly period or the monthly cycle or menses. So when a woman knows exactly when is it over and she would have the clear discharge afterward and she purifies herself Mm -hmm. and takes a shower, she can pray and fast. When she sees this discharge afterward, which is nothing like the regular period, Mm. we call this istihada, a regular bleeding. It doesn't stop a woman or prevent her from praying, fasting, Mm. reading Quran, touching Quran, entering the masjid, Mm. or even having uh, an intimate relationship with her spouse. But if she wants to pray, then it is required to perform wudu prior to every prayer once the time has entered, not before the adhan. And with this wudu, she can pray as many prayers as she wants. The fard and all the related nawafil and the extra supererogatory prayers. Now remains another very interesting thing, which is what about the clothes, if they have been moist or soiled with the, this irregular bleeding, mm. it's impurity. So mm. it has to be washed off. That's why wearing a pad in such condition is recommended mm. where you can just replace it and pray. Even if while praying you feel this charge is excreted, it is okay. Because you're still in a state of tahara, conditioned purity. Waiting until the time of the next prayer enters then you will have to perform a new ablution. Okay. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. We'll take a short break here on Ask Hudan. We'll be back right after this. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The deeds are bound by its intentions. The deeds that we do we have to have a sincere intentions that we're doing it only for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have the best definitions of things, the right vision, the criteria in which we would get to know what is right and what is wrong through the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. The tafsir of the Quran is to explain, is to interpret the best words, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. were in vain because of ignoring or turning away from this great foundation. We see many people coming to the way of truth, following the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but later on, 
they get off track. What is the reason behind that? Unity is a result, it's not a cover-up. We have to be united from inside. And Allah made this clear in the Quran when He said, وَأَطِيعُ اللَّهَ وَأَطِيعُ الرَّسُولَ Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We're back here on Ask Huda. Just a quick reminder of our telephone numbers 00202 248 or 249. If you don't have the chance to call on our program, you can always send your questions to our email ask, that's ask at huda.tv. The next question is quite an interesting one, uh, Doctor, from Anne. And she's asking about the authenticity of a hadith which states that Allah used the excess of uh, Adam to create a date palm tree? Uh, first of all, I noticed that Sister Anne normally brings some very interesting questions. Mm-hmm. And this is one of them. And she said that she's editing a book. So thank you so much for trusting us and consulting us uh, concerning this hadith before approving or disapproving. Uh, first of all, this is not a hadith. Its chain of narrators is, is extremely weak, so we cannot consider it a hadith. The hadith says in Arabic, or the so-called hadith, because as I said that, it has a very, an extremely weak chain of narrators, so it's not uh, an authentic hadith. It says, أَكْرِمُوا أَعَمَّاتِكُمُ النَّخْلَ It says, you should honor your aunts, your aunts, mm-hmm. and your paternal aunts, mm-hmm. because the amma in Arabic is a paternal aunt, and the khala is a maternal aunt. So it says, you should honor and treat with the due respect your paternal aunts. Who are they? The dead palm trees. Why? Because Allah created the dead palm trees. Uh, before I go any further, uh, I am saying, I'm quoting the statement which is not a hadith. So I don't want anyone to cut and paste or take things out of context. No, I'm just trying to verify this is not a hadith. Because it has been created, the dead palm tree, from the leftover of the clay from which Allah created Adam, peace be upon him. Mm -hmm. Uh, Logically and historically and uh, from various point of view, that is not true. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored Adam by creating him by his own hands while he created any other thing by saying, kun fayakun, be and it was. So, the creature which was created from teen was Adam alayhi salam. So sister, I highly recommend that you advise the author of the book to eliminate this statement and do not, uh, do not include it in his book uh, as a hadith. Thank you. Okay, Jazakallah Khair. We have sister Abira from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum, sister. You're live and ask for your questions, please. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Both of you are in good health. Thank, Thank you, and you too. I wanted to ask if, if Muslims are allowed to donate their vital organs after their death. Are you calling from Pakistan directly, sister? Yes. You're the first caller to call from Pakistan. Do you know that? Uh, no. <laughs> Which part of Pakistan? Islamabad? Lahore. Okay, thank you so much. And give our salam to all the Pakistani brothers and sisters. Okay, that's Sister Abira there from Pakistan. We also have Brother Ali from the other part of the world, United States of America. Assalamu alaikum. Brother, you're live and ask with your questions, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, I wanted to ask what the maximum period of nifas or postnatal bleeding is um, and uh, the condition that sometimes it might coincide with the period. Does this mean uh, the last period from 10 months ago, uh, meaning when, the, when that period occurred and then you just count uh, 10 months? Okay, uh, Ali, this question, uh, even though it was answered last episode, but because of sometimes it is urgent, the maximum period for the postpartum bleeding or post-delivery bleeding according to the vast majority of uh, the fuqaha and the scholars and the companions is 40 days even if the bleeding continues afterward unless if it coincides the same regular period of the monthly period then we will consider the number of days of the monthly period then afterward uh, the woman would have to uh, take a shower and consider herself as uh, pure from uh, the bleeding and pray and fast and uh, 
resume her regular religious activities. Thank you, Ali. I have a, a second question, if it's possible. Okay. Um, I've heard that uh, it's permissible to delay the prayer for the purpose of seeking knowledge. And I've heard somebody quote a narration of Ibn Abbas where somebody stood up and said, As-salah, as-salah. And he said that uh, I know the Sunnah better than you and that uh, we used to do this during the time of the Prophet Alayhi salatu wa salam. Okay, we'll answer this inshallah in order. Okay, this is Brother Ali there from the United States of America. Um, Brother Hassan asked, are the events happening in the month of Muharram in Karbala from Islam? Uh, unfortunately, whatever you guys see, whether Muslims or non-Muslims, that have nothing to do with Islam. Whatever the sect which they call themselves Shia and supporters of Ali and loving of the family of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Ahlu Sunnah, the mainstream of uh, this Ummah of this Muslim nation, uh, they love Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We do love Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his family more than anybody else. And the actual proof to that is that we're following their footsteps. We're not innovating. We're not labeling them with things that they have not done or trying to raise them to status beyond what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put them in. They're already honored and noble and the most noble. And that's why in every prayer we say, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad and upon the family of Muhammad. And wa barik ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad and bless the family of Muhammad. Uh, bless Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the family of Muhammad uh, upon them, uh, blessings and peace as well. But what you see uh, on the occasion of Ashura, some people who beat themselves, injure themselves, and they send the worst signal to non-Muslims about Islam, those people do not represent Islam. They do not represent the family of Prophet Muhammad, they have nothing to do with Islam, their practices and their actions are totally condemned by the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ says, لَيْسَ مِنَّا مَنْ لَطَمَ الْخُدُودِ وَشَقَّ الْجِيُوبِ وَدَعَ بِدَعْوَ الْجَاهِلِيَةِ Very simple, straightforward hadith. One who slaps the faces in mourning, in grief, and tear their clothes, and act according to the da'wa and the work and the traditions of ignorance before Islam, he is not one of us. So they have already put themselves in this um, territory. Mm. They are not amongst us by their choice. How could Allah the Almighty ask somebody to injure himself while he's the one who said in the Quran, لا تلقوا بأيديكم إلى التهلكة Don't you throw yourselves into harm's ways. And he said, لا تقتلوا أنفسكم And don't you kill yourselves. And our most beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا ضرر ولا ضرار Harm should not be uh, inflicted nor reciprocated. So with all the hadith and the ayat, these practices are totally false. As historically speaking, it has nothing to do with the occasion of Ashura because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to fast on the 10th of Muharram before Ali and Fatima got married. So that means before al Hassan and Hussein were born. While the sect of Shia, who deviated a great deal from the deal, when they abandoned al Hussein, may Allah be pleased with him, when they invited him to come to Iraq, and they will support him, again is the Umayyad Caliph, then they abandoned him. Him and his family were slain, and they did not lift a finger. So they're blaming themselves for that, and they're mourning his death. So they are blameworthy in the beginning, and they're blameworthy by the end as well. So may Allah uh, uh, accept the martyrdom, the shahada of uh, al Hussein. May Allah be pleased with him. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said in a glad tiding, al Hassan wa al Hussein. they are the masters and the leaders of the youth, in paradise. Uh-huh. So we revere them, we love them, but we do not act according to the practices of the ignorant people. Zafla We have brother Abdul Rao from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Salaamu alaikum brother. We'll like and ask all your questions please. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah brother Fawad and Dr. Salah. One of my friends recently returned from his annual vacation and he was saying he did not find time to distribute his annual data among the needy people. Mm-hmm. He's lived in KC from quite some time and I was somehow trying to convince him to pay uh, a TV channel like uh, Huda TV. Mm-hmm. 
Mm. I also want to know if he donates his zakat money to a TV channel like uh, Buddha or some other uh, peace channel in India. Will the uh, reward be diminished uh, anyways because he is not distributing among his poor relatives and this zakat? Okay, okay. Brother Abdul Rauf there from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Then we have Sister Raul Naka from UAE. Assalamu alaikum, Sister. You're live and ask their question. questions, please. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, yeah, I performed uh, Hajj this year. Okay. And uh, immediately on my return, so many wanted me to ask dua, saying that uh, the duas will be answered for the next 40 days. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to clarify whether this is authentic or not. Okay. Yeah, thank okay, you. Okay, that's Sister Raul Naka there from the UAE. Um, our question here from Sister Asya from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. She says, some people have the tradition after completing the Hajj to frequently make Umrah, and some of it, some of them do it on behalf of dead relatives. And is this from Islam? We say this is not prescribed. The mm -hmm. Prophet ﷺ, when he performed his Hajj, he had an access to perform more than one Umrah. Mm -hmm. uh, to the extent that his wife Aisha, since she had uh, the monthly period before Hajj, so she could not perform the Umrah, the Umrah of Tamattu or Al-Quran. So afterward, the Prophet ﷺ complied with her wish, and he, and when she insisted that she wanted to perform Umrah, so he sent her brother, Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Bakr, may Allah be pleased with all of them, to give her company just a few miles out of Mecca in order to perform an intention of Ihram, so that they come back and perform Umrah. It would take him half hour, an hour to escort her and go with her, then once again come and perform Umrah. Mm. And it will be legitimate because he's gone with his wife, but he did not. Have he done that, it would have become a tradition. Yes. So, if you're going to perform Hajj, it is sufficient to perform one Umrah, and this is what the Prophet wasallam did. If you still insist, I cannot tell you it is Haram, but it is not the Sunnah. And now, it becomes dislike when you keep doing it back and forth, back and forth, to the extent that we see people do more than one Umrah in the same day. With regards to performing Umrah after Hajj on behalf of the deceased, it is permissible, and may Allah reward you both for that. Okay, and our second question is, um, can someone design or beautify their homes with different decoration, different background settings and so forth? Why not? We're designing the studio here as well. As long as you're not hanging pictures of live objects, Mm -hmm. or pictures of humans or animals, stuff like that, uh, or statements which may contradict the concept of belief. Otherwise, it is okay without exaggeration, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that He does not like the extravagant. Okay, we have Brother Hassan from the UAE. Assalamu alaikum. Brother, you're live on Ask Other. Your questions, please. Wa alaikum as -salam. Go ahead, Brother. Yeah, uh... In my home country, there's uh, a belief that uh, women cannot greet uh, men uh, using the, you know, the our, our way of greeting, which is Assalamu Alaikum, and that uh, when they're greeted by men, they should, uh, or when they greet men, men shouldn't um, answer them back. Is there something to this, uh, or is it just uh, not at uh, all? Know? Not at all. These are pure tra cultural traditions. Have nothing to do with Islam. Okay, could you please explain from uh, from the hadith? Uh, I, I, I will, inshallah, in the same order. But uh, I just wanted to refer to quickly that uh, greeting by saying "Assalamu alaikum, wa alaikum assalam" and answering back, it have done by the Prophet sallallahu and by the companions among themselves with the proper etiquette, with the proper hijab. Going to extreme, not even to uh, answer the salam if either one of them started the salam, that's too extreme. Okay, that's Brother Hassan there from the UAE. If we can take one of the questions from today's episode, Brother Muhammad, he was asking about... One of the questions were today's episode, mashallah. <laughs> okay, um, uh, he was asking about reading Quran after from Fajr to sunrise, and he says, does the person have to stay in the masjid, or can he go home and, go home and read the Quran until sunrise? The hadith, which refers to that, which is collected by Tirmidhi, and narrated by Anas ibn Malik, may Allah be pleased with him, says exactly, مَنْ صَلَّ الصُّبْحَ فِي جَمَاعَةً ثُمَّ قَعَدَ يَذْكُرُ اللَّهَ حَتَّى تَطْلُعَ الشَّمْسِ فَصَلَّى رَكَعْتَيْنِ كَانَ لَهُ أَجْرُ حَجٍ وَعُمْرَةٍ تَامَّتَيْنِ 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 So the hadith is very explicit in this regard. It says if you pray Fajr in Jama'ah, 
and hang around to make azkar, not just read the Quran, make tasbih, the, the regular azkar of the morning until sunrise, then 15 minutes past sunrise, because this time is also disliked to make any prayer, any voluntary prayer during. 15 minutes past sunrise, you pray just two rakahs as minimum. You may pray two, four, six, and up to eight. Two by two. So praying two rakahs past sunrise, if you sat after fajr to make azkar or recite Quran, that will secure you the reward to performing complete, perfect hajj and umrah. On a regular basis, the hadith was listed amongst the virtues of praying in congregation in the masjid. So it encouraged us to go to the masjid. The brother was asking, what if I go to the masjid, then I go home, and I do that at home. Mm -hmm. I say, Allah knows best. But the hadith is very explicit in this regard. So Anna will also say that if somebody has the habit of staying in the masjid afterward to make the adhkar until the morning, then for once or whatever, he had to leave. And on the way he was making the adhkar as well, then he prayed. I definitely believe that Allah would not deprive him from the reward because he has the habit or he had the intention of doing so. Mm -hmm. But the hadith is very explicit uh, in this regard. Okay, we have Brother Muhammad from the UAE. Assalamu alaikum, brother. You're live and ask other questions. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah al khair. Jazakallah al khair. What is that? Very, uh, I mean, fantastic opportunity for us to, you know, uh, know about so many things. Uh, Sheikh, my question is, like, uh, we have a tradition. It's, 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 it's not a tradition or uh, something. But mm -hmm. uh, we have something like when we go for Eid prayer and come back home. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a tradition of touching the feet of the parents and taking their uh, dua. So, no. is it, is it uh, permissible or not? Or maybe the wife is touching the feet of the husband. Okay, okay. So, just to take take the dua or something. Okay, okay. And one more thing is... Is there any wife who still kisses the feet of her husband? No, it is not uh, kissing the feet, just touching the feet and taking... Ah, uh, touching the feet. And that is the same practice with the parents about returning from me, touching the feet? Yes, touching. Just I believe this is a Hindu practice as well, right? Well, it has been practiced. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I really miss uh, Brother Jamir Rashid. He would mm -hmm. have helped me a lot in this regard. Yeah, it, it, is, it is a practice of them. Okay. Uh, Brother Muhammad, uh, your second question? Okay, I think Brother Muhammad left there. Um, Sister Rakaya asked um, if a woman can give a lecture in front of men. If it is necessary, and she has certain knowledge to pass on to men that no man can give, and she's wearing the proper hijab, it is permissible. The mother of the believers, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha wa used to teach, but from behind a veil, a hijab. وَإِذَا سَأَلْتُمُهُنَّ مَتَاعًا And if you ever ask them for any need, then فَاسْأَلُوهُمْ And ask them from behind a veil. Yes. Not face to face. Not face show, showing the face of a woman, speaking to her freely, because there is a temptation and a fitna in that. Yes. There is no difference between the practices of Muslims and non-Muslims uh, uh, in this case. Many of uh, the companions, the ladies, were teachers. And uh, tabi'een, and the contemporary women who have certain knowledge that men did not have. Just recently in Egypt, a couple of years back, one of the highest isnad in the recitation of the Qur'an, a lady whom the great shiuch would come from abroad, from different parts of the world, to recite before her the Qur'an, to perfect the recitation, in order to get her permission, the ijaz, and her name was Umm Sa'd. May Allah have mercy on her. Many, many of our shiuch have gotten her their ijazah from this lady. May Allah have mercy on her. And now they are giving ijazah to others. So it is permissible with the previous conditions. Okay, and... Uh, Sister Dori asking, um, what is the ruling of a woman whose husband recently passed away and she is 59 years old? But just before you uh, answer this question, can we take the phone call? Sister Saiba from UAE. Assalamu alaikum, sister. You're live and ask other questions. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I have a question okay. regarding the recitation of the Quran. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the we should recite Quran and uh, they will get the benefit of it. Uh, sister, uh, can you just turn on turn on the volume of your television set and repeat the question, please? Uh, I have a 
question about the recitation of Quran. Okay. Benefits the marhumi. Okay. They are dead people. Okay. okay. How, okay. How, 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 what is the truth about it? Okay. 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 That's the right practice, sister, is read the Qur'an for your own benefit, earn its sawab, and by the end of the recitation, make dua for the marhumin. Make dua for your beloved one who passed away. That is the proper way. But it is not in the sunnah to recite the Qur'an and say, Oh Allah, give me the reward of my recitation or my prayer uh, to somebody else. It is permissible to do that on uh, giving any charity or performing hajj or umrah on their behalf, not in the, the prayer, nor in reciting the Qur'an. Okay, we have Um Habiba, Sister Um Habiba from the UAE. Assalamu alaikum sister, you're live on Ask Your questions please. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to ask a question that a person has not received his salary for more than a year, one year, three months. Okay. And he's uh, struggling with his, uh, whoever his uh, authority, but they're uh, every time delaying uh, what I mean, we are praying the dua like Allah Almighty or the become Alhamdi or Hazmi, many other duas, mm-hmm. and doing patience. What else you can do? Okay. okay. This okay. is one question. Secondly, the touching of the feet is a Hindu practice in India, mm. which uh, I just wanted to confirm. Okay. And my uh, my third question is mm-hmm. that uh, uh, the salah when uh, when the azan is over and the ikram is salah is there. Can a lady pray the salah between this time or she has to wait for the ikram of salah and then pray okay. half a okay. salah? Okay, that's Sister Um Habiba there from the UAE. And if we can quickly touch the, 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 the last question I ask you, Sheikh, about the woman whose husband recently passed away and she's 59, what is recommended for I'm her? I'm sorry, I missed the question, what is it? Uh, she's, her husband passed away uh, recently and she's 59 years old. Okay. She wants, what is recommended for her to do? Okay, uh, if he has just passed away recently, you are in the idda and the waiting period and the mourning for the death of a husband is the longest, which is not permissible to mourn any other person uh, more than three days, but the husband, four months and ten days. So you should hang around in the same house in which your husband passed away until the idda is over. Avoid wearing any perfume, any fragrance, or any makeup, or even surma or kohl, until the four months and ten days pass by. Uh, it is permissible during the day to go out to buy your needs, basic needs, if you have to, but attending parties and traveling and all of that unnecessary things is not permissible as long as you are in the morning period. Uh, please accept my condolence and the condolence of all the audience, I believe so. May Allah have mercy on your husband, may Allah have mercy on all of the dead Muslims and the living ones as well. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh, for all your answers today. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve you Amen. for us. We can, we can benefit more from you, inshallah. <laughs> Just before I leave you, I would like to remind you, if you still have questions, you can ask us at ask at huda.tv. And don't forget, you can always support us here at Huda TV by sending that email to uh, support at huda.tv. Until next time, Salaamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If my love is attached to thee, Then from sins I will be free Each time my heart will beat Your name will resound with heat Allah is my heart's speech Your mercy is what I beseech Keep in my heart your remembrance And in your deen allow me to advance Help me in my quest Permit me to pass the ultimate test